wearing your favorite color today, Spilly. Great to see you, dude. I haven't seen you in a minute. How you been, man? I'm doing good. How are you? You look like you're still in shape. Are you eating? Uh, yeah. Are you eating like a bird, or what are you doing over there? I actually threw down last night. AJ and me at, at dinner with with some of the crew here behind the scenes, and he almost um, finished a four ounce steak, Spilly. He almost finished so, it. Hey, listen. I mean, like he's like Ned Flanders. If that shirt comes off, it's just shredded shredded guys so that's awesome i also wore my hat backwards so i feel like i'm part of the posse it's good hey. <laughs> <laughs> Yours, i'm used to you having it like this with the flat brim a little to the side you know like this yeah, yeah exactly you know. yeah now that's, i'm now yeah. now we go okay perfect there you go let's let's do it spilly style for for 15 minutes here so so spilly uh, first off i mean i don't know how much you caught of this but can you answer aj's question about like what the plan is long term and where you think the plan should be to get back on the winning side of things. Cause there's not really any hope right now. Well, uh, you, you know, it's kind of funny you bring it up like that. And I did listen to you and AJ, you, you have a cut, you have a lot of things, right? It is about pitching. I, I think a couple of things that we've noticed in years past, and maybe you've heard Dan O'Dowd talk about it on MLB network or different uh, people within the organization, about 20 years ago, there was a presentation about how sinker ball pitchers um, don't have high slug percentages against them. And as a result, like this, this one time from a long time ago, uh, really stuck with the Colorado Rockies. So there was that, that time frame where you had Aaron Cook, you saw Jason Marquis, um, you had a bunch of guys that were considered sinker ball pitchers. Now, the problem with that, and it's true, if you have really good infield defense, and if they're throwing strikes, then it works, right? Like you're not going to have a ton of slug. It's going to be hard to put some um, some at bats together to score runs, and and it worked for a period of time. Unfortunately, if you do look into like the and you guys know this, especially as catchers, sinker ball pitchers have a higher walk rate. They have a a lower strikeout rate, and when they do miss up in the strike zone, the ball goes a long way. So that's a pretty bad recipe when you have those type of pitchers and they're not the elite level sinker ballers, a Derek, uh, you know, a Derek low um, just, I mean, there's not a lot of really good sinker ball pitchers. So unfortunately for the Rockies, they they were always looking for that type of guy and didn't always have it. So when the Rockies were successful, they had pitchers like Herman Marcus who could still strike people out. They had John Gray who could still strike people out. They had Kyle Freeland when he was at the top of his game, he was pitching to contact and it was more like pop-up. So to me, the philosophy should be, and we've noticed this too, elevated fastballs, forcing fastballs, good ride at the top of the strike zone actually does really well at Coors Field. So to me, if you want to take a combined approach of some sinker ballers with some high spin rate guys at the top of the strike zone and then come with a different mix, that is how you get back on track in Colorado. I love everything about what you said, the whole <clears throat> kind of talking about what kind of pitches need here, what needs to be thrown, what should. Now, to me, just hearing you say all that, isn't it just sometimes overkill a little bit? Why don't we just look for the right pitcher, a guy that could throw strikes and get guys out? You know, sometimes I think people look too far into, you know, mechanics or what a guy can do. I get the air is thin, the ball is going to travel. Why don't you get some dogs out there, some guys that could just pitch? I think that is something that we get away from sometimes, and I think that's you know, part of the game moving forward, that analytical part to it that we get too invested in. You're right. I mean, Todd, if you have a pitching staff that acts as if you know they walk around and they control the mound, even if they don't have the greatest stuff, uh, it works. The The best teams in baseball right now are, th are consistently throwing strikes. So the Seattle Mariners lead baseball – and strikes in the strike zone. The Rockies last year were at the bottom of it. Um, velocity also matters. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, last year, the Rockies were at the bottom of baseball in, in overall velocity from a, from a rotation. So when you're not throwing strikes and you're not throwing as hard as everybody, not a great combination, but you're right. That additional element, which is don't give a, don't give a rat's ass about what you're doing. I'm going to go out there and compete that's needed. Uh, and not everybody has that. I mean, there's plenty of examples of guys that have come from, uh, that visit from other organizations. They're like, dude, I can't pitch here. This place sucks. Um, and it does. I mean, that's the, that's the reality of it. Sometimes it does suck. Sometimes it's fine. Um, but the guys that have embraced it, Kyle Freeland, Chad Bettis, there, there's another 
a player from back in the day that they embrace it. Uh, Pedro Pedro Stasio, PD, uh, is one of the all time uh, you know win winners in Rockies franchise history, and he had almost a five ERA. It's because he was just trying to beat the other guy on the other side. So you're right about that. I mean, that's that's hard to it's hard to find, hard to factor all the time when you're trying to say because I think everybody wants to compete, but until you get in that environment, that's mm-hmm. where you have to start sorting people out. Hey, don't forget Ubaldo too. Ubaldo was. Pretty darn good. He didn't care where through a hundred though. Well, true. I mean, you know, those guys are a dime a dozen though now, Spilly. You know, everyone throws a hundred now. <laughs> What's a hundred? That doesn't mean anything anymore. All right. So I always say this when I when we used to go to Coors Field, you had to make a choice. Either the outfielders played shallow, you took the bloops away, or you moved them back and you try to take the, the gap shots away. I, I always wanted my infield or my outfielders to play in catching because I thought the bloops hurt you more than the home runs because most times the ball went over your head at Coors Field. It was a home run anyways. What's your what's your opinion on that, AJ? You you are you are speaking the right language. Play shallow. Um, we have seen the Dodgers for the last couple of years. They play the shallowest outfield at uh, at Coors Field. They also have a pitching staff that throws strikes. But it's it's what happens to the pitchers when they make a good pitch, right? Like you, you jam somebody, uh, you get somebody out on their front foot, and they just kind of flick one in the outfield. You want those to be outs. You don't want that to fall in for a hit because it's deflating. You much rather somebody steps on one of your pitches because you made a bad pitch and you're like, dude, if he makes the catch, awesome. If he doesn't, that's on me. So I'm with you. I think we have also seen some of the athletes in the last two years, like Nolan Jones, super underappreciated freak athlete. Uh, And then Brenton Doyle, who's been in center field, who won a gold glove last year. That's the best center fielder Coors Field has ever had, plays a shallow center field. And so uh, I'm with you. You play shallow. You trust your skill set. If somebody hits it over your head, it gets hit over your head. But you cannot let the ball fall in front of you. So convince us how this team can you know, avoid the 100 loss mark again, obviously being in a division that's that's freaking good and got better so far this offseason. And they've, they've done a few things. We went over it, but not a lot, right, to make a huge dent, especially on offense when that was the thing. The lineup wasn't there last year. So, like, what has to happen? Like, a Chris Bryant resurrection? What do you think? Uh, I mean, I, I feel like we're still we're still a little ways away from them being in, in- – striking territory to get to the postseason. I mean, they, a lot of things need to go right, Scott. I mean, that's, that's, that's a, that's the problem here is will Chris Bryant be healthy for a full season? I think so. I think he's in good shape. Uh, he's a good player, but I, I don't think he's going to be carrying the offense. Some of the young players like a Nolan Jones is going to get a full season. He's really exciting. Tovar's taking a step forward. Uh, getting Brendan Rogers healthy is important. Seeing right, I mean, a bunch of this is like you need this to happen, and then this to happen, and then this and this and this and this. Um, it's it's a really difficult division. I still see a little bit of a transition here from you know eventually Charlie Blackman is going to move on. Uh, Elias Diaz is is at now thirty five, the catcher. Um, I I think we're going to have to start seeing some new pitchers too. Senzatella. Herman, Cal Freeland, as it, unfortunately for some of those guys, Herman is coming back from Tommy John, and Senzatel and Freeland are still in the middle of uh, of their contract. So they need they need a bunch of things to to work out. The Meyer League system is actually pretty robust right now. So depending on if the Rockies are willing to make some trades, which that hasn't been proven in the past, um, they have a ways to go. All right, so let's get back to some good news here. Uh, Todd Helton, Hall of Famer. Uh, I saw the video. We all saw the video, the excitement. You know, he's he's such a great guy, well-deserved, you know, one of the best to ever do it, especially in a Rocky uniform, man. Talk a little bit about Todd and the impact he's had over uh, a lot of people and the impact in Major League Baseball. Well, I I don't think you would appreciate this, this Todd, for you, the Todd father. I mean, this was the original Todd father for me. Uh, He also hit with two strikes better than anybody I've ever seen. Uh, when you think about flat baseball approach, Todd was was unbelievable. He was taught at a young age. He had incredible bat-to-ball skills. He was a, an incredible athlete, played football in front of Peyton Manning at the University of Tennessee. He was a Golden Spikes. He, he pitched. He was basically Otani uh, before Otani. I, I think in the case of Todd, when it's all said and done in the part where, you know, people have always kind of pooped on Coors Field, like, oh, what an easy place to hit. 
it's rare that people talk about the the physical toll it takes on your body. So he didn't get to 3,000 hits. Who cares? His OPS numbers, OPS on the road, he was better than Dave Winfield, better than Tony Gwynn, better than Vlad Guerrero. And that was coming from altitude down to sea level where the ball does move different. And Todd never skipped a beat. And you're in the National League West. So I, I, I love that he's represented now. I think it's really cool, too, when you have a player that played for one organization, start to finish, and then be that good and get the recognition. It means a lot to me as a former teammate. I know it means a lot to the organization to see this. Uh, it means a lot to Todd and Christy and, and his, his daughters, uh, Gentry Grace and, and Tierney Faith. Like It's a big deal uh, for Todd to get into the Hall of Fame. And beyond that, I, I love the fact and AJ, you could probably speak to this. When somebody has a two-strike approach, that's the difference. That's the separator that that make that takes you know boys to men. Uh, and Todd was a two sixty career hitter with two strikes, two sixty. So that's the part where I think it, when it's when it's all said and done, he's one of the all time greatest hitters with two strikes. And uh, that's the reason why I think um, I'm so happy to see him in the Hall of Fame. Well, I thought he should have been in a long time ago, but that's just – and also, Spilly, I'm so old that I was going to go to the University of Tennessee, and I would have been Helton's teammate. And I went on my recruiting visit the same weekend Peyton Manning was there. So that's 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 how old I am when it comes to, to knowing Todd Helton for, for, what, almost 30 years now. So I'm very happy for him, and, and congratulations, obviously, to Todd, but does Todd ever talked about his last about? We just showed it in that highlight pack, or his last home run, excuse me, where Jake Peavy just grooved him that home run. Did he know that was coming? Did not know it was coming. Uh, I wasn't there. I was in Japan at the time. It was like 1030 in the morning because of the, the time difference. Uh, I was a puddle watching that with the home run. I, I mean, also, there's a lot of battles between Jake and Todd over the years, especially in the National League West, but especially when Jake was a Cy Young. So that, that respect, uh, and I mean, like, if you've ever been around Jake, you, you love Peeve. You know, he didn't, I don't think he grooved him one, but he challenged him with one, and Todd did miss, which you guys know more than anything. That's, that's not easy to do with the pressure of having everybody there with you uh, for the last day. That's a really special moment. And, I, I mean, like, if you don't love Jake Peavy already, uh, to go and say, here's one, you know, good luck hitting it. I mean, that's that's. Tat, you know, tip the cap with the flat brim to uh, to peeve. Yeah, that was an awesome, awesome, awesome moment. By the way, can you point over your right shoulder? I think it's your right shoulder. Whatever, I don't know. TV sometimes the other one. So your your left shoulder. How many? How many of those trophies you got up there? Oh, these Emmys. Yeah, those <laughs> I got things. Them at a, I got them at a garage sale. <laughs> yeah. I only I only have five of them, but I got them at a oh, garage sale. Oh, only five. Okay, back there. Wow, uh, Spilly, world's, world's greatest Emmy collector at garage sales. You got Rosie, yeah. you got it's Rosie weird, you walk into garage sales, they're just there, and you just have yeah. to be hey, there. Hey, Todd, yeah, you saw I got Rosie the Red back there. That's a real thing. Uh, she's my number one. I mean, if if my wife is ever slipping, that's that's who you'll find me with, <laughs> yeah. Rosie the Red. <laughs> she's a beauty, brother. I've seen Happy. her too many times. She's a beauty. <laughs> For sure. Well, oh, Her Spilly, eyes. Th- it gets dude, me all the thanks. Time. Epic, epic behind the scenes there. Um, thanks for joining us, dude. I know you got your show on series coming up right now, and obviously can hear you on Rockies TV, Apple, the whole deal over the past year. Love what you do, and good to see you, man. Appreciate you. Great, great to see you too. Get in eight out steak next time. Yeah, 